YouTube. So I've been absent for a little bit. Uh, last week I had all the intentions of filming a weekly vlog like I have been doing for quite a while now. And it came to like Thursday or Friday and I was just saying, okay, what do I need to catch, what books do I need to catch you up on to see what my previous clip was? And that was Thursday or Friday. And <laughs> the last clip I had done was Sunday. And so I just, I hadn't got anything really filmed last week. And with it being really, it was so busy with work because we're gearing up for year end chaos. <laughs> so, and I knew like this coming week is, you know, of course, Thanksgiving and a long holiday break. So I thought, okay, let me just hold on vlogs because I'm going to do first time ever. Like last year I tried Vlogmas, but it was just like kind of like dipping my toe in. I did, a, I don't know, five or 10 vi videos. But I feel like this year I'm on a vlog roll <laughs> because on September I belatedly joined in on the shorty September and I vlog every day for that. And then from October on, I've been doing weekly vlogs. So I feel like I've gotten lots of practice. And so I was like, why not take a break from vlogging and go full force into December. So fingers crossed, I'm able <laughs> to upkeep the daily vlogs then. Um, but in the meantime, I um, have been reading quite a bit. Um, I was kind of um, unofficially <laughs> stuck inside because my car, I had, I had worked on it on a couple of weeks ago, but there was like a part that was faulty. So I had to go back in the shop so I've had quite a bit of time at home. I mean, I, I'm close to um, several shops I could walk to if I, if I needed it, but it's been kind of fun just um, like for cooking wise, like just using what I had stored up in my pantry and the freezer and like stuff I, I, you kind of forget about. I'm like, okay, what can I do with this and this? <laughs> so it's actually been kind of a, a fun test for me and um, more, more kind, of, kind, of like, kind of like not buying books when I have so many, same thing with food especially like the non-perishable stuff I feel like that just piles up and like I never actually get to because I'm just constantly focused on the stuff that's perishable that's gonna the fresh food and whatnot that's gonna be fire soon and the other stuff I just never kind of get to so it's been kind of fun with that um but anyways I have been reading quite a few books like I mentioned um I'm not going to talk about the audiobooks or the ebooks I've been reading a couple of those but I've been mainly focusing on the physical books because I'm doing the 100 book challenge and um, as I'm doing a check-in, I might as well talk about that. I am currently at 89 books, either that I've read or I'm uncalling. So I am doing pretty good. I think but when all this gets piled up, I, I think, I don't know, probably 30 are the ones that I've read. So if, if you just count read books, if I was doing that part of the challenge, I would still have you know, around 70 more to go. But still, I'm counting it all as a win here because I'm making my own little rules um, for that challenge. So anyway, I'm going to go in the order in which I read these books. And so I'm also doing nonfiction November. So I think all of these, except for a couple, are nonfiction books. So the first one is Life at 50 Below Zero by Christina Regal. This is about a teacher who she, this was written um, during, well, I don't know if it's, when was this published, but um, it's taking place in the 1970s. This is published in 2020. Okay. It was not written in the 70s, but there's tons of pictures of her, um, her and her children out in Alaska. So she is a school teacher in the San Francisco area. Her and her husband both are teachers, and her husband gets, hears about how they are hiring teachers in like the way out in the middle of nowhere, like these little villages in Alaska. It's like, why not? Let's, let's just try and, and see if we get it. And she's like, okay, not, not, not thinking it's going to happen but they, they do get hired and so almost every single year they are moving all over Alaska um because like it's like a one-year contract and you can stay or, or move on and so predominantly it's like right in the middle kind of near Fairbanks but not really she talks about you know Fairbanks is like a the point of reference but it's like oh like 200 miles this way or something like that <laughs> so I mean you know kind of sort of because Alaska is such a big state um but in the 50 below zero part because a lot of places that she's living it gets 50 or colder below zero and talks about how she has a really hard time with that because not only is she living in the middle of nowhere in the 1970s but also she's going from san francisco you know with all the amenities you can think of to a place where like you can't even um count on running water as something that you're going to get when you're hired for these positions often like she's lucky to have electricity <laughs> some of them and yeah, no running water, no you know, electricity, things like that. And so it's like very much a primitive lifestyle. And um, so like that combined with being very, very cold. And so at the towards the end of the book, 
she finally gets a job in Juneau, Alaska, which is a completely almost like she talks about like a different world really from all the other places she's living in the middle because Juneau's like on a little strip like against the border of Canada towards the bottom. And so it's more of like kind of like the weather here in Portland where it rains quite a bit and, and it's warmer. So, um, but, but still the rain there is like double what Portland gets. So, like I know Portland has like a rap of, you know, lots of rain and gloomy skies, but, but Juno is worse. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so like it's, and then she doesn't have any children at the beginning, but then she get, kind of gets in the lifestyle of like this, you know, the, the dog that well, really her husband does really likes getting into the, um, owning and breeding the dogs and whatnot. So she gets into the, the sledding and then she has children. So you get like that aspect and then the different villages. So this was, this was interesting. The one thing though, is that I think this is like her very first book that, you know, it's written. And so like, if you can see here, how it's broken down, it's very choppy because it's like, it's a little, um, each one's a little different topic. So it's not smooth at all. It's, it has like problems with transition. And because it doesn't have that, that continuous narrative, it was a little bit hard to constantly focus on. Cause like, I feel like this is a book that you could easily put down at any point, at any little paragraph that you have read. So it's a little, that part was, I had a hard time with, but the story itself was interesting enough to, to pull me through, but the writing was, was not that great. Um, so hopefully I don't spend, um, too long on the rest of these books because we'll just be here forever. <laughs> Cause I didn't count how many books I've read since I uh, last talked to you. Um, I, I know I skipped, you know, this is, I'm filming this on Saturday. And so I have this week's reading and then last week's reading. So, you know, ba basically two work, two weeks worse. And, but anyway, this is, anyway. It's going to be, I'm going to be here if I don't speed things up. So the next one is Oregon Trail, Last of the Pioneers by Rick Stubber. I thought this was fascinating because I've read quite a few like Pioneer, Frontier, and then Oregon Trail stories. But this one is about, I think it's in the back here. This one is about people he, um, he has interviewed um, that are living in, in Oregon or Washington, California area, mostly Oregon, but who are still living this, um, so like you have people like in their 90s, 80s and 90s that um, that are telling their story from when they were children. And so let me see, when was this published? It was, I think it was like 93 or something. Uh, yeah, 93, I was right, I remember. Cause I was like, what? <laughs> like, I guess it can't be 2020. Um, but yeah, and this was written in 93 and like most of these interviews were taking place in the 80s. Um, yes, yeah, so people, people born in like 1918 and um, let's see, 1900, 1898, he's interviewing um, you know, before this book was written. So yeah, this is, it was fascinating to get like a living history of some of their, some of their stories. And none of them are too long. Most of them are just a couple of pages, but still regardless, I thought that part was just fascinating. And then also there's illustrations of different animals you'll see. And then, the, and then the, you know, very, very back of the beginning, the author talks about how he, um, walks 500 miles of the Oregon trail himself and um in the Oregon section of it and he talks about going down one of like the blue mountain area this like steep hill and there's still um back in the 80s and 90s at least at that time there's still like piano pieces and different like, wagon wheels and whatnot that have, were fa had fallen off of the wagons as they're going down the steep hill and so like I made, made me want to go check out um <laughs> that area see what all I can find and then you know the early 2020s is there anything left uh, I'm sure there's bound to be if you look hard enough, but yeah, that, this was just really interesting, interesting take on that aspect of that part of history. Um, the next one is Bayou Backwaters by Alan W. Eckhart. Um, this was a really good book because um, I, I was mentioning like, even if the writing was awful, I, I just, the illustrations alone were going to, were going to sell it for me. But yes, the writing, the writing was really good. It was kind of reminding me of Sally Carragher's nature writing because it's all told in the perspective of the animals. You know, the animals are the characters even though it's like, you know, a nonfiction story. Um, and then I looked up this author and he, I think he was either nominated or he won Pulitzer Prizes, um, <laughs> at least one of them. So um, yeah, so the writing um, lived up to the covers. Okay, let's see. New Kids in Town, Oral Histories of Immigrant Teens by Janet Bode or Bodie. I was looking to see if there any other books besides this bookshelf I have behind me because this is all nonfiction. I want to see if there's anything else I could find and there was a couple and um so this was on my middle grade shelf but this author Janet she was interviewing teenagers mostly I feel like in New York City area 
that were coming from all over the world who were immigrating to America. And some of the um, interviews were like a year into living here and other ones have like three or four years. Um, but the one that she gives the most detail to was um, about a, a, let's see here. It's been a bit since I read it. I know it's like from Vietnam, but yeah, um, a, a boy uh, who's, um, who's 20 years old at the time. So she also gives the ages. So they range from, uh, let's see here, 15 years old to 20. Um, but yeah, so you, all, all over the place. And if you do a map as well, I think that covers. The, but yeah, this, this was interesting. Um, and this was, I think this came out in the 80s, um, 89. And you know, it's still, still completely relevant today. And um, yeah, you know, kids can now can you know, empathize with these, these kids because a lot of them talk about, you know, leaving their friends, leaving their boyfriends or girlfriends, probably leaving their family behind. I mean, some of them from really rough backgrounds, like complete, absolute poverty, war zones, things like that. And then making this switch to America, you know, where it's like the kids, you know, their age are going to the mall and like they're, they're, the type of thing they're dealing with, you know, not everyone, but you know, is like finding a shirt to match or, you know, this event or, you know, what have you, the little, little things like that. So like that acclimation um, could be only, I mean, could be very difficult. But the one thing I, w I will say though, is um, in addition to, uh, I like, you know, encompassing so much I mean, different age groups, backgrounds, all of that is that it's an, like, as it mentions, it's an oral history. So the, all the writing is done like verb, it's like verbally. So like the, like Janet seems to be like transcribing exactly what each of the individuals, um, as they're, as they're speaking it, uh, their story. And so you really get a sense of, um, their personality, which I, I really like as well. You know, more of that empathizing with the teenager, uh, mindset. This next one is River Notes, The Dance of Herons by Barry Holston Lopez. Um, Barry Lopez is, I feel like, you know, up there in names of nature writing, and I have not read enough of him. I think the only one other than this that I've read is Horizon. I do have of um, Wolves and Men on my shelves. I think, oh, can I grab it? This is the book I do want to get to eventually. Um, I, got, I got this, um, I think, on a the summer trip I had recently. Um, in a way, this one, though, it's, it's really thin. And it's like, I don't know, probably like less than 100, but yeah, 80 pages. Um, I'll put it right in Fable's, um, <laughs> right in front of Fable's face. Of course, she's going to smell it. And I was like, well, she doesn't chew on books. But just in case, um, since she's a little bit riled up with me talking, I'm going to move it out of her way. <laughs> anyway, so River Notes. Um, this is, I think, is only the second book, I, second or third book I read from him. This one is very much a poetical lyrically told story and that put me off from the writing it wasn't so much of a I don't need like a scientific fact-based story on, on a river but when it gets a little bit too I don't know out there for me I just I don't know for whatever reason I couldn't fully connect to the story so it opens up um like you get in the mindset of a heron and that took me forever to figure out <laughs> I feel like longer than it needed to be because I kept saying I I I but then the eye I was talking about wasn't human. And then it said to me, what are, what are we talking about here? And I don't know, it's just like the experimental kind of writing. I don't know, <laughs> which I feel silly, you know, criticizing, uh, you know, a, a famous nature writer, but yeah, just for whatever reason, this just didn't hit the mark for me. Then I read a children's picture book, Raven, a trickster tale from the Pacific Northwest by Gerald McDermott. Um, as I mentioned in one of my, I think one of the um, 100 book challenge check-ins, I have, at the time, 14 unread children's picture books. So I was looking to see, and this, this isn't um, nonfiction, we're not here to know. I do have a couple though on there that are nonfiction. But this is like a, you know, folk, folk tale, folklore, um, Pacific, about the Pacific Northwest um, Raven and its story of it taking the sun as a, as a light and, you know, sharing it with the world. And the world starts out, you know, like dark and gloomy, like, you know, like the Pacific Northwest tends to be, um, especially now, except um, the last couple of weeks, it's been so sunny and dry, no nothing um, compared to how it normally is with it, you know, because normally I feel like October, especially November, um, gets a lot of rain, but it, nothing at all. <laughs> I feel like we got a couple, I don't know, a couple sprinkles here and there um, in a way. But yeah, this, this was okay. Um, folk tales, 
and like mythological stories it's never or fairy tales none of that's my jam but for a children's picture book I, I can read it and this is one of the Caldecott um runners up books that um, I, I do um, I would like to to get to and read all of those um this is one I got in another book I got um over my over the summer this is conversations on history and literature Wallace Stegner and Richard W. Attilé. Um, I wouldn't read this unless you're familiar with Wallace Stegner's work and there was a, quite a few books that I haven't read so I had to like skim over those parts because I didn't want to be spoiled for anything because I've read a lot of his books but not everything and you know not everything was mentioned in here. Um, but he also was a professor at a you know university he was like he taught many famous people or influenced many famous writers that you would you would know and so I thought that part was fascinating his and what was interesting this was um has an um, introduction that uh like 10 or 20 years after this book was written but let me see when was this yeah 1983 and then they had another little mini interview in 1996 um, but in, even back in 1983 when they were doing this interview um Stegner was only got to the, like part of like the American West he was talking about how he can even at that time talking about like the Colorado River how it is very much overused and how he can, he can see that's going to be a problem <laughs> you know even back then I like, gave the next couple of years and then you know of course now and you know all the droughts and things like that like I was just mentioning how you know right now we're, we're, we haven't got hardly any rain um but I think it's like part of like the El Nino like swing of things um like warmer and drier where I'm at right now where I'm at where I, I am at here in Oregon for for this winter in a way um but yeah this was this was pretty good um I did have to skim over like I said some parts and some parts were just not as interesting honestly I wanted the interviewer to just like shush <laughs> so that so that you could just like get Wallace Stegner's own words uh because the interviewer several times like even though like a couple questions before Stegner had already answered or addressed this question he's like I guess he was, it seemed to me like the um the interviewer had a, was just going down a checklist and even if the author had like addressed it he was just still gonna go down his checklist kind of thing so yeah the interviewer got a little bit in the way for me um on this one the next one is a slim book the Ingalls Wilder Home Sites by Evelyn Thurman. Um, and this is like a little pamphlet because I have several little pamphlets. Um, because also, like my top shelf here, I have like more <laughs> Frontier, or this one's like a Lord Ingalls Wilder shelf. And so, I had a bunch of nonfiction I want to get to um, this month. And um, with this one, it's not exactly a <laughs> not exactly a narrative story at all, it's really more of like a tourist pamphlet. Because it's, I don't know how many pages, let's see, it's um, 90 pages, but it's like, gives you lots of pictures and descriptions and like maps on um, what to do um, on each of the home sites for uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And it also included um, Florida, which I thought was interesting. And um, the author interviewed people, family um, of the Ingalls, um, Ingalls side of the family that were living there. But um, yeah, include both the pictures and whatnot. So I mean, it's this for sure is something um, that that's just for like <laughs> little house on the prairie fans that would find interesting. Um, I don't think it's not for like the general <laughs> the general reader, but it's still fascinating enough for me. And there was quite a few um, locations that were mentioned that um, I'm interested in seeing myself. Okay, the next one is Country Chronicle by Gladys Tabor. I adore Gladys Tabor, and I well, now want to own everything by her. Um, I've read, I only read, I think, three or four of her books, but um, I was looking at, on Wikipedia, and she has written so many, and I just want to own all of them. <laughs> but this is, this is, I'm um, talking about her home, Still Meadow, in Connecticut. I mean, it takes you throughout the year, um, each season, and she talks about, like, um, different foods. She includes several recipes um, that, that she's often cooking during that time, and it's just, it's just a, a just a warm cozy blanket is how I would describe this book um, and she talks about how she right before this book um, she had produced um, published a cookbook and she said that's not the only way we cook what she's ever gonna do but she but she does include like the instructions and the weights and everything for some of our recipes like I was mentioning and here's off on the back with her cat Amber and Amber um, takes uh, center stage quite a bit in the, in the story and how 
she doesn't like any of the animals kind of like getting those skunks and whatnot raccoons and other cats that come by and because the author feeds all the different animals and um cat doesn't like it she's like we'll have to rule the roost kind of thing but yeah this is just delightful and also in um this copy included um the previous owner um got this book in 1985 um, it was the first edition, it says, and then, so they read it in 1985, and then the second time they read it was 2010, the third time, 2016, and then the fourth time, 2020. So, like, I feel like I need to write my own note of, like, my, when I bought the book and all of that, but I thought that was just really cool. And then in the back, um, like, the recipes I was mentioning, the person who owned this book note, jotted down the name and the page, excuse me, the page number for all the recipes, and then um, she also lists all the books that the author mentioned and um yeah and then she also included the author um Gladys Tabor mentioned some of her favorite books and authors so she wrote this uh, this person wrote that down as well um <laughs> so yeah this this was really interesting I I love um you know reading used books with like that kind of note taking I don't mind there's also a couple like check marks like, sprinkle here and there like things that the um that the previous owner um wanted to remember but also this included what is this um different books this didn't, wasn't mentioned these books weren't mentioned at all in this book but it's like seems to me books that the um, that the owner the previous owner wanted to get next um a Dor Dorothy Sayers book um the Kane Mutiny and I don't know the name of the author <laughs> it says um <clears throat> another Still Meadow book she wrote those down uh, Don Camillo um <laughs> so so yeah that was interesting as well I left that in here I'm not sure if the author, um, that's the author, I keep saying the author, I don't know if the previous owner was using this as a bookmark and forgot and left the, their notes in here or what, but, um, yeah, well, pretty cool. The next big chunker of a book I finally finished, this is One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. Um, these are letters, and they're edited, selected and edited by Robert Giroux. Um, this is a book I started back in May, and, um, I, I downloaded it here and there, and then I was like going full force. Um, these last like month or so and I finally got through it um Elizabeth Bishop I um I bought this book a couple of years ago and at the time I was interested in like because I've been making a point to read more poetry and so I had heard of Elizabeth Bishop Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bishop and I saw this near the poetry section when I was browsing a bookstore and so oh this is cool I'll pick it up but I said basically I bought this book before I ever read any of her poetry and then in the meantime of actually reading this book I did try her poetry in I don't know if I it, it didn't it didn't jive with me um it felt it didn't feel like poetry if that makes sense it felt more like stories like meditative stories so I feel like it's something I, I need to, I need to give a second try at for sure but basically to say I picked this book up I bought this book and I read this book without really reading any of your poetry um <laughs> but this is like the author's journey really um it, it goes from like it goes always like the day she died, but it starts in 1928 and it goes all the way to 1979. So it spans the time of when she is just getting in to writing and she meets, you know, all these like famous people that, you know, or, or, or famous people that we don't know at the time, she doesn't know at the time that are going to be famous kind of deal and or people who are mentors that are already experienced in the world of um, writing and literature and that kind of like help the author um, you know, edit and, you know, give opinions and, you know, share advice, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the author eventually, it's really, it's like, almost like a mini biography. Um, the one thing that I wish that we got some of her responses, because some of the time, um, it gives you several, several, um, letters back to back to back on one person she's corresponding with, but you, you, you obviously know that there's a conversation taking place, but you don't get that, the, you will get half the conversation. So that, that was a little bit annoying, but it's, it's such a big book that I can see why they, they didn't want to do, um, Robert didn't want to include those, um, but, but it would have been nice, but you follow her whole life and it's really hard to summar, summarize in just a minute, but it was, it was well worth the time um, that I put in it. And just, I, I need to get to her poetry, but yeah, yeah, let me know if any of you have read um, any Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bishop's poetry um any encouraging words would would be good because <laughs> poetry is it's hard for me sometimes and if it's i don't know if it's not clicking with me automatically i feel like uh, it's quick for me to to drop it in don't want to do that um the next one is essays of eb white um this was just as good as i thought it would be here's the author on the back and this covers a um a multitude of things it's just his thoughts on 
um, his time um, at his farm in Maine, New York City, Florida, um, some random like childhood uh, memories, um, talks of, talking about the railroads and the ocean, and then book, and it ends with literature. So it's like books, writing, um, authors. So yeah, this was just great. Um, even though this was written way back when, it's still, um, it's still really good. Let's see, it was written in 1977. Um, but it came out in 1934. Um, this, this edition was in 1977. In a way, well, you know, because this is like a collection of the essays. So I think maybe the first one was published in 1934 because it also gives you the date. So this one was like Key, um, Florida Keys, 1941 was the one this one was published. So I really want to read more of E.B. White's nonfiction. So I feel like if this is just one collection of essays, I know there has to be more out there. And so I'm all, I'm all here for that. Um, this next one is a kind of like a picture book because I have on my very top shelf, I have quite a few picture books. And so I'm like, I'm just going to like pull one down um, here and there. And so this one is the lasting impressions of the art and life of Regina Dorland Robinson by Donna Curler. And this I found, I believe, in Ashland, Oregon when I was on a trip. And the author, the painter, is from that area but um, when I was reading, I knew nothing about the author. I've never heard of her name or, or, or recognized any of her paintings. But she died at a very young age um, from suicide when she was like 24 or something. But here is, here's the author here. So it gives you her life story. And, um, and then, it, you know, she has lots of her, her paintings and um, her, her life and her inspirations. You know, where she was living, you know, things like that. So that part was interesting. Uh, but the paintings were just like I, I like these well enough like the um the portraits but like this kind of thing these um her her uh flower paintings are just i don't know they look blurry to me like out the people are fine but just like the other ones i didn't i didn't care for but i i'm not an artist at all and um <laughs> but yeah they're they're good enough um to look at and, and flip through yeah so this i don't know if it's, if it's just the photo reprinting or what but they just yeah, look blurry to my to my eyes even even this one um anyway so yeah this one is interesting to pick up and you know read about an on artist's life uh okay speaking of people's lives that i find interesting rachel Kalloff's story jewish homesteader on the northern plains so um i always browse like the nonfiction um area of bookstores when i when i go into them I've been book shopping for quite a bit since the most hundred book challenge. But I'm just saying, when I do, that's what I, I like going for. Um, but well, I saw this one. Um, it's talking about, was it North Dakota? Yeah, North Dakota. And um, there's a lot of books where it's like you break it down, you know, by, by location. But so, I, but I didn't really, I've never read about um, a Jewish homesteader before. And the area that the author goes to is all settled by um, a Jewish you know, the Jewish culture and religion, but the author herself comes from this like small impoverished area in Russia and her journey, her, her life story there was just awful. Um, she, her and her siblings, um, her mother died and then her father, their father didn't care at all for the children and were left with just table scraps maybe to eat. And then he gets married and the stepmother doesn't care anything and the kids come crying to him and he just doesn't care at all. He's all just infatuated with the stepmom and doesn't want to hear nothing bad about her. Um, and so and so then eventually she's able to break away from that but has to leave all of her siblings behind and never is able to see them again and who knows what's going to happen to these kids. And then she makes her way to America because um, she's 20, I think 18 or 20 years old and um, is considered a spinster, an old maid and has no hopes because she doesn't have a dowry or anything like that in this uh, in Russia to get her anywhere, have like a status. And so she meets um, her, uh, a family um, friend, um, connects her with a man in America. So they would just pass just a couple of letters um, between each other. And then she's not officially like, like it's not <laughs> signed in writing kind of thing, like she has to marry him. Um, but they get there and they meet each other. Like, okay, we're, we're okay. We're getting, we, so it wasn't like a permanent, it didn't, you know, wasn't forced exactly. If that, if that makes sense. Um, but then when they get to New, when, when she gets to New York, it's like they, they, the horrifying things continue because, um, she gets, she's living in this like tenant, tenement housing 
and there's bugs all crawling all over the place. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so she finally gets out of that. She's only staying for a couple weeks, but get enough money so they can continue on to North Dakota. And um, her new husband, all of his family is like you know, on these lots. They bought you know, lots all around each other. So they're all kind of like, like a community of, um, you know, community spending. So like they're, whatever they say, you know, whatever, whatever they, they earn, they can all like share, share their wealth. <laughs> so like good times and bad kind of thing because they have nothing. They're living in like hovels. Um, like literally she's, they dig out a little spot in the earth <laughs> so they can stay warm. And it's just awful. It's, <laughs> it's just awful to read about. It was, um, and then I, I kept thinking, okay, she wrote a book. So she has to eventually be able to get out of this, you know, to some extent. Um, and she kind of does. Like, she has many, many children, like, within a year of each other, back to back to back. And that wears her down. And she talks to, and so she has, like, um, sees many doctors later on to try and help her. And it really, really takes a toll on her health. Um, so, yeah, this is just fascinating like horror story, horror story. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just amazed that, you know, the author, you know, still was able to like have her druthers <laughs> to put a book together after all of that. My goodness. Um, let's see. The next one is uh, Pioneering and Gold in Alaska from 1883 to 1923, Sourdough Sagas. Um, and this is put together by Herbert L. Heller. Um, and this is like a, you know, gold mining in Alaska. And I was hoping going into this, that it would focus a lot more on the Alaska side of things because gold mining, I don't really care to read about that. I mean, it's just like, I just, I feel like, you know, of course, you know, you're in it for the money and, um, that kind of mindset just puts me off completely. Um, and unfortunately this was a miss for me just because of the, the topics um, when they talk about Alaska, they're, they're constantly hunting and killing everything. I feel like everything in sight, they're try, you know, luring animals in to shoot them. And then, I, I don't know, it's, uh, it's almost reminds me of like the, um, the, bu the buffalo, how, you know, they're just getting like a little piece, like the tongue or whatnot of the buffalo and then, you know, leaving the, everything. So that's what it, this kind of felt like, even though it wasn't completely true of this one, because, you know, they're out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, just trying to have any kind of sustenance. But sustenance, but um, but yeah, it's, it just feel like it, oh, there's constantly shooting things that or, or digging for money or talking about money and or you know, drinking, and it's just like that whole mindset, it wasn't for me. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, I've gotten through it and you know, ticked the book off as <laughs> as read and off my shelf, but but yeah, this this wasn't for me, it wasn't what I was hoping it would be. This next one is another children's picture book, um, Autumn, Autumn Peltier. Water Warrior, written by Carol Lindstrom and edited by, um, illustrated by Bridget George. And the cover is what drew my eye. And I got this from a little free library. And when I was looking, this book came out in 2023. So this was like a brand new book, um, picture book. And it's in great condition. And this is all about um, an indigenous um, tribe that um, is living in Ontario. And, um, but the story is told in perspective of the water because, let's see if I can find some pictures here. Um, so they're talking about how the water is polluted. Um, and so that, so then this tribe is trying to gather attention, um, to keep the water clean, to keep the water clean. Um, and so at the end, it talks about how the tribe has walked like, all around Lake Superior, their whole, uh, like, over 2,000 miles. They did it one year, and then every year since, they have walked it. Let me see here. Um, yeah, in 2003, they co-founded the Mother Earth Water Walkers. And, yeah, they walked 2,726 miles, the whole circumference of Lake Superior. And um, when Josephine did this, she was, what was it, like 70 or 80 years old? Let's back and find it. You know, she, she was a, a grandmother at the time. It took them, um, their walk around um, the lake took 35 days and it launched the water walk movement. And between 2003 and 2017, Joseph and the water walkers have done the, um, the walk 13 times, walking over 15,000 miles to you know, raise awareness of keeping the, the water and oceans clean, the rivers clean. And so yeah, I, I, this is a really cool children's picture book. And it made me look and see if there's any other books um, by this author, and I read one other, um, an ebook um, talking about like hair um, with the indigenous tribes, like what the hair means to them, because um, talking about the schools they went to, you know, way back when, how they would chop the hair off to make them more like Americanized 
or at the time I guess you know can it can can it Canada as well um but then they wanted like, the, the daughters wanted to grow their hair out and like what's the difference between between what's the meaning behind behind it kind of thing um the other children's picture book the last one I have here is science a uh, science and nature guide on birds another uh, little free library book I found but this is all about like how you can attract birds so it's like you know how do you how can you build your own um, bird bath how can you build like your own like um a, a bird blind so you can see you know see the birds without them seeing you so they're going to you know get scared off and fly away but it also um talks about um different birds um depending on the, the location so this is in evergreen forests and let's see here and like broadleaf forests like it, it kind of reminds me of um the peter what is it called the peter the, 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 you know the golden books for adults talking about the different birds but it's like you know a children's version but i like the full the full um covers here talking about, um, about different birds you can see in the different landscapes but it does give you a lot more detail um, on different birds but yeah this is just a fun thing to to browse through and perfect for, for kids um, who are interested in getting into watching birds i wish i had that as a kid because i've never even as an adult i don't really bird watch but it would be fun to get into as a kid um, or an adult yeah um this next one is life on a five pound note by evelyn hoskin um this is a book about new zealand which is a different location um from all these other books i've been been reading but this came out in 1964 and what's cool is at the very back um it included um newspaper clippings from new zealand and this town where the author is from and then also a note to like a friend um that the previous owner was talking about like oh here's some newspaper clippings from, from the author um let's see i'll show you the author here um but she um it came from an impoverished area in england um and her her mother was just living a horrible life like in like with the factories like the um in like uh, was it York, yorkshire area and so her grandmother was just like you know died at age like 40 just like, completely overworked malnourished you know had no food like she's like, living on bread and water and working 16 hour days all the time and so eventually they go the orphans get sent to new zealand and then the author mostly grows up there um but it's talking about this like homesteading area let me see if i can find um this area um what's the town name it's like tillamura Tim 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 is um so the, they're living on the coast tomorrow and they're going um uh west into the mountain region and so like even like the um the cover uh pages here are really pretty and this is this was printed in new zealand as as well but um this is the author's like first book and only book i think um she wrote, wrote this when she was in like her 70s or 80s and it, the um, introduction talked about how um she was just going over to her friend's house and sharing stories with the grandchildren there her friend's grandchildren and sharing her stories about her family and um her time out in the farms and the friend was like you know we really should write this down because if you don't then this history is going to be lost um and so it was like oh no I, I i can't write and then like the very next day her friend comes over here like giving her a pencil and um a, a notebook and like, here write it down please <laughs> you know kind of thing. so okay i'll try so um like, same with one of the other books um this wasn't you know the best told story or anything like that but for what it is um uh, if i could let local history um uh, it was it was pretty good um <laughs> so, so yeah there is that one and then the very last book to catch you up on everything that i've been reading since we last talked um is a another one of these um little house on prairie like little pamphlets this is the story of the ingles family by william anderson william anderson has put together a bunch of different collections on different topics um related to laura ingles wilder and this is like a little mini biography of um of the family so like the, it, it has includes lots of pictures and stuff too too so this is like Ma and Pa, and so what I liked at the very back, it included an appendix, and it gave you like I don't know ten or so pages of Grace Ingalls, um, the youngest um, child in the family, and it gives you her diary from let me see here, what did it um, do from eighteen eighty seven to eighteen ninety three. So I'm a little bit insight into Grace's life and what's going on in school and what's going on with Laura and she's popping in bringing Rose, um, her daughter, to the house and things like that. And then it also gives you like a mini um, biography of the Ingalls family, like 
um, the father of uh, Charles Ingalls' uh, parents, which would be um, the grandparents of Lord and Miss Lauder. And then it also gives you um, the Quinter side, uh, uh, Laura's mother's family as well. And so just, um, again, for sure more of a person who's interested in that, uh, you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, topic. Um, but yeah, so then it also gives you like a whole list of books that William Anderson has written. And this is, I don't know, like 50 pages or so, but, but fascinating um, to me for, for what it is. Um, but anyway, so that's all I've read so far, so far in the last, last like two weeks. I can't give you a pile of it because it's like, I don't know. Um, I feel like it's probably like maybe 20 books or so. But again, a lot of them have been short. So I've just, I've been trying to like balance the, the bigger books with the shorter books and just, yeah, just get through all these books for the 100 book challenge. Because I think I'm going to make it probably within the next week or so. I'll get to 100, which is will be fun. But I want to keep going till probably around my birthday or Christmas um, to see, to see what, what my total ends up being. But anyway, I will talk to you in a little bit. Thanks, book two.